Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley, and I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from drugs and alcohol. And I just want to point out the mug shots were in the beginning, not in the, not after. <laughs> My sobriety date is June 18th, 2017. I just want to open up in prayer. Dear God, let me get out of the way of myself. Speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll start off by saying I'm 28 years old. I guess that would make me a 90s baby. My mom and dad's, my, not, my mom and my stepdad raised me. My mom broke her back when she was only 25 years old. The result of that is she's been handicapped most of her life. She's the strongest woman I know. I had a fairly normal childhood, well, normal to me. Looking back, my first memory of being different was when my friends and my brother and his friends were picking on me, and eventually I said I wanted to kill myself. Of course, my mom had me committed. That's when medication entered my life for the first time and the false belief that a pill can fix any feeling. I realized then that I never felt like I fit in with the crowd or even in my own skin. In the fifth grade, we had to take D.A.R.E. In that class, I won the gold medallion for best essay on how to say no to drugs. I never went to church growing up. I never even went to Sunday school. It's not that my family didn't believe in God. It's that my dad didn't believe in church. Eventually, we moved to Tennessee, where I got a job at Dollywood at the age of 14. It was a magical first job. Not long after working there was I asked if I wanted to smoke weed. Can you guess how I responded to drugs the very first time being asked? I said yes, without a second thought. Soon after, I began to abuse pain medication. The first time I took a narcotic, I felt free, like I was finally comfortable with who I was. In reality, I was just numb to the feeling of being uncomfortable. After the first year of college, I was back in my hometown. My disease continued to progress. I began to sell drugs, no matter what the consequences, I couldn't stop using. My parents kicked me out eventually. I was homeless for the first time but I had plenty of friends, I mean strangers, that I never felt actually homeless. After a month of not being able to sleep in my own bed or ha and having the feeling of safety and comfort that comes from your own home, I begged my mom to let me come back. We made it down to Florida and the withdrawals are so unbearable that I would smoke spice while also seeking out gentlemen that clearly had disabilities, like missing arms or legs, just to feed my disease. After five months of living down here, I find out I'm pregnant. I never noticed the symptoms of the first trimester because I was withdrawing from opiates. My daughter, Sarah Blake, withdrew from methadone the first five weeks of her life. My daughter, that didn't deserve any of this, was fighting for her life because of my actions. Within six months of not working any kind of program, I was picking up a new drug for me. Like any drug, I went to the extreme quicker than ever before. A week later, I was on my way to jail to catch my first charge. I was so scared of being in jail for the first time. I can remember just wanting to lay my head down and go to sleep somewhere warm. But there was only a cement block in the cell. I was released from jail, and I tried to get on the right track. I really did, because I didn't want to end up back there again. I did well until I met a boy, early in sobriety. And we began a dangerously codependent relationship. It wasn't long before our relationship became abusive. And then it wasn't lo much longer before DCF got involved. After a month in jail, I ended up for the first time in my life truly homeless. I would walk around all day aimlessly, just wishing somewhere inside 
just wishing I had somewhere inside to sit down and rest. The longest night of my life, I walked to the nearest gas station at three in the morning, and I found the dumpsters with a fence around it. No one would see me there, right? I would be safe. I broke down cardboard boxes and I laid down. I just needed some rest. I was so exhausted. Eventually, I made it to jail safely. I spent the next five months there. I signed up for Justin's place while in jail because this time I didn't want to walk out of those doors without a concrete plan in place. I don't know why I'm standing here today telling you my story. I don't know why I'm here and so many women I was in jail with not only just relapsed, but they're not here on earth any longer. But I thank God for the grace he has poured over me. I was released from jail at 6 a.m. The enemy tried to keep me that day, but God's will for me was stronger than ever. I walked into Justin's Place Recovery Program on November 1, 2017. I can remember sitting on the top bunk and my bunkie having a sponsor day one and reading her big book and Bible. I would try to be like her, but I would fall asleep and the Bible would fall off of my bed and hit her in her sleep. Hopefully she worked through that in her fourth step. At this time, I really opened, only opened my Bible or my big book when someone was influencing me. I can remember finding a children's storybook Bible in the director's office. I started reading every night to the women in my room. I loved that book because I could understand it. I was finally able to understand when, when the other women would reference different stories in the Bible. This is the first time that I had hope that I could be a warrior for God. Let me share with you the first time I felt the Holy Spirit's presence. It was a normal Sunday morning. All the girls were at Christ Central for church. I was standing next to my best friend now, but at the time, just another girl in the program. She had her hands up, praising God all over the place, and I was being influenced to do the same. But I was scared that she would hit me if I closed my eyes. <laughs> I slid over slightly, and I closed my eyes while lifting my hands. I was praying to feel God's presence like the other girls. When I opened my eyes, a flag was waving in the distance. It said Jesus on it. And all of a sudden, I started crying uncontrollably. It's like God's spirit was softening my heart in that moment. I got home from church and shared my experience with anyone that would listen. I couldn't believe it. After that, I wanted more. I started reading my Bible during quiet time. I started taking the time as the most important time of the day. When I spent time with God, I felt comfortable in my own skin. As I continued my journey in recovery through seeking God in my own time and growing as a godly woman, I found my personal relationship with God through Jill's place. But it was so much more than that. I learned how to do laundry properly, how to fold your clothes as soon as they get out of the dryer. I came into the program and just crumbled up my clothes and threw them in the dresser. And that was normal to me. There was nothing wrong with that. One of the girls helped me fold my clothes and put them away. The first step, one girl taught me how to army roll clothes and put them in the drawer so you could fit more. Another girl taught me how to properly fold them. And another girl taught me how to donate the old so that I could make room for the new. Through Jill's place and being in recovery, I learned how to be a woman. Some could say I grew up in that year. I'm still growing. As I stepped out of the boat, a door opened for me to move to Naples. I started working as a cashier at St. Matthew's House Surf Stores. God revealed to me in prayer that I didn't have to be a case manager to help the hurting. My friend Ashley once said to me that God might reveal to us the destination, but that doesn't mean that the route will be clear. 
God's calling and purpose for me is bigger and mightier than I could even imagine, but I must stay the course. Once again, down in Naples, another girl offered me rides to AA meetings and church. I started going to AA meetings every single day and church on Wednesdays and Sundays. I lurk. I look back on my journey and realize that the community of women are what helped keep me sober. If I moved to Naples, if I moved to Naples and didn't work a program or didn't have rides to meetings, I don't think I would be standing here today. Look around you. Some of the men and women will be a part of your journey. You just have to ask for help. I believe AA is a part of my recovery because I see tangible evidence in the rooms of people staying sober the rest of their lives. I want to die sober. I don't know what that looks like, but I do know I must put in the work. So with another woman in the program pushing me to get numbers and get a sponsor, I was able to finally sit down with a sponsor and start working the steps. Every other time I tried to get sober, I never worked the steps. I had this fear of the unknown, fear of hard work, fear of not doing it right. I put pen to paper and wrote my first step. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. It's funny when you say that out loud. Yes, my life is unmanageable, and I'm powerless over drugs and alcohol. It's another level when you have a list on paper of what made your life unmanageable. I cried when I read to my sponsor my list. I couldn't believe some of the things I did to survive, but that was normal to me. I didn't see anything wrong in the moment with washing your hair in a gas station bathroom, you know, going to the bathroom outside because there's not a toilet in sight. There was nothing wrong with that. I was scared on my fourth step, which I think most of us are, are, right? Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. How do I make a fearless moral inventory of myself when I'm consumed with fear? I figured it started with a lot of prayer and all throughout prayer. I broke the fourth step down so it wasn't so scary. Sharing every part of my past and present with someone was the hardest thing, but I was so desperate. I was desperate enough to want to change, to be better. I wanted a real life where I'm an amazing person to be around. I know that sounds silly, but don't we all want that? Step six. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Let's be honest. I have a lot of character defects. My sponsor pointed out a lot through my fifth step that I was still in denial about. She showed me character defects that I was still partaking in with being one year sober. Sometimes my ego thinks, I went through a year-long faith-based program. I don't have character defects. I'm a godly woman. That's my disease talking. Through working my fifth step, my sponsor and I made a list of everyone I needed to make amends to. Before I could start step 10, she asked me to make an amends to my mom, the one I hurt the most. Before I made amends, God walked me through a trial in my life that showed me exactly what kind of mental pain I put my mom through every single day. Every time I talked about it, I cried, not because I was hurting, but because I put my mom through that over and over and over again. I had the opportunity to make several amends since working step nine. And that's where the spiritual experience happens for me. I remember when I saw my grandpa for the first time in recovery. I hugged him and we both cried. And I could feel the Holy Spirit come over us us, and wash away the hurt and pain. Today, I was able to be there for my grandfather 
when his wife of 52 years passed away. I was there. I was present. Each amends was different for me. As I went through steps 10, 11, and 12, some days were harder than others to practice these steps. I've had some kind of commitment in my recovery journey. I've taken meetings into detoxes and rehabs. I've chaired big book meetings and helped start Zoom meetings off in the pandemic. I believe having a commitment in Alcoholics Anonymous has helped me stay grounded in the program at all times. My life sometimes will be falling down around me, but I suit up and I show up for that commitment. They want me to describe how God has transformed me. What comes to mind is that when something bad happens in my life, my first reaction is to escape through drugs and alcohol. Today, I live in the solution. I'm allowed to drive on the road legally. (laughs) I also, for the first time in my life, have my name on an apartment lease. I recently got a secured credit card also, and I'm working on my credit. So one day, I know it's tangible today, I will own my own home. Today, I pay my bills on time. Being a grown-up in recovery is a hard job. (laughs) Guys, I'm not kidding. It's a hard job. That's why God made Choose Recovery. We never have to be adults alone. God spoke to me when I celebrated my first year in recovery. He said, God is light. There is no darkness living in him at all. 1 John 1, 5. And then he backed it with, For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. 1 John 2, 8. I couldn't help but walk in his truth that he was speaking over me. I wasn't even done with my year-long program. But he spoke to me that I need to walk in his light. That I don't have to finish this program or walk across the stage to have his light shining through me. To reach someone else that is still hurting. Today, I have a personal relationship with God. He has transformed me into a new creation. I seek him daily to grow a strong relationship with him. He continues to open doors for me, but in his timing. I recently started going back to school for my business degree. As soon as he spoke it to me, within two weeks, I was picking out classes. I'm a straight-A student today. That's only possible because God is glory, if you saw my grades back in the day. <laughs> Thank you, God. I, today, I'm not currently sponsoring anyone. My home group is for the drama party meeting every night at 8 o'clock. COVID-19 shifted everyone's recovery. Everyone's. We had to recreate what recovery looked like. I stand here today because God wanted beauty from ashes. I'm just a nobody trying to describe God's love at a human capacity. I will continue to seek him. Thank you, guys.